Okay, so this is a talk I originally gave at my library in April of 2012, um, and the intent of the talk was just to give people some background on gamification so that they understood what it was and was not, uh, and also give them enough information that they could see some of the potential benefits of uh, gamification techniques in a library setting. So let's start with the very basics. What is gamification? Gamification is the process of applying game thinking and game mechanics to engage users and solve problems. Um, it's taking insights that we've learned from successful game design and wrapping those insights around advertising, healthcare, education. Um, so what do we get out of that? What is it that we gain by taking gamification techniques and wrapping them around real, real life? Um, one word, engagement. Engagement is the connection between a user and a product or service. Now, game designers have a whole vocabulary for thinking about and talking about engagement. For example, the length of time between now and the last time a user engaged with your service or bought your product would be recency. Uh, the number of times they've interacted with your service or bought your product in a given time period would be frequency. Um, the amount of time they spend engaging with your product or service would be duration. Um, but what it all gets down to is getting people to use your service more often or buy more of your widget um, or check out more books or use your library more often. Um, games are crazy insane good at generating engagement. I'll give you an example. Uh, World of Warcraft is uh, one of the largest uh, multi massively multiplayer online games in the world. And it has about over 10 million subscribers. And they play on average about 20 hours a week. That's a part-time job. That is a huge amount of engagement. And so what people are doing is they're looking at that and thinking, you know, if I could motivate just a fraction of that engagement for my product or my service, I would make out like gangbusters. I would sell more widgets. I would have more visitors to my website. I would have more users in my library. So that's the whole point. Um, so before I talk about how uh, you use games to create that engagement, I think it's worthwhile to take a minute and think about um, why it is that games are so sticky, to use an industry term. Why is it that they are so engaging? What is it that they do for us that makes us want to interact with a game? The first thing that I think games do is they set up this really powerful positive reinforcement loop um, where they quantify achievement, break it down into steps, and then reward you um, as you're achieving. So in real life, uh, achievement is often frustratingly diffuse and indeterminate. Um, for example, if I decided that I wanted to be a, an ALA uh, tech trends mover and shaker, if, I, if that was my goal, then uh, there are things that I would have to do, obviously. I would have to go to uh, conferences. I would have to write papers. I would have to talk to people who nominate um, for that sort of thing. So how many papers do I have to write? How many people do I have to talk to? How long is it going to take me? Uh, to complete that process. I'm really not sure. Uh, and this is the thing about achievement in the real world, right? We often don't know exactly what we have to do to achieve that goal or how close we are to achieving it. This is very, very different in a game. Um, you need 20,000 experience points to be level 2 and you have 10,000. Well, you know, you know exactly where you are and how far you have to go to achieve that goal. Uh, to unlock the next stage of the game, you need the flying carpet, the magic hookah, and the elf statue. Well, you have the elf statue and the magic hookah. You just need to find the flying carpet, right? So one of the most powerful things that games do is they quantify your achievement, and then as you're achieving those things, they give you this constant reinforcement, um, telling you how close you are to, achieve that goal, to achieving that goal. And when you do achieve that goal, you get rewarded for achieving that goal. For, for example, in a role-playing game, for attaining a new level, you get new powers. Um, and this is a really, really powerful construct. Um, there's been research that has shown that this sort of effort and reinforcement loop actually unlocks chemicals in your brain that make you happy. Uh, and video games are especially good at this because they can give you this constant automatic reinforcement. Um, no human intervention needed, which is, I think, part of the reason why video games are so addictive. Okay, so this is part of the reason why games are so sticky, is this, this positive reinforcement loop. But there are others. Um, for example, games are also very, very social. Um, this researcher, Richard Bartle, did a study of gamers in the 80s, and he basically broke down gamers into four types of gamers. There are your killers, who are very, very competitive. They want to know that they're better at something than someone else, ideally better at something than everyone else. Then you have your achievers. These are the people who want to achieve things, and they want their achievements to be recognized by other people. 
Uh, your explorers are the people who are interested in sort of exploring the parameters of the game, what is possible. And then you have your socializers, and these are the people who play to socialize with other people. And what Bartle said is in, in any uh, given group of gamers, your socializers are going to outnumber all of your other types of gamers put together. So why is it that people who want to socialize gravitate towards games? I think there are two very important reasons. The first has to do with the way games give our social interactions shape that they would otherwise lack. Think about being at a cocktail party. Uh, if you're anything like me, then you're going to be standing there with a drink, um, wondering how to approach people, um, sort of drifting into conversations that then sort of peter out, um, wandering around from group uh, to group of people. It's very nerve-wracking and stressful um, and can be very frustrating. Now think about the same party where we're all playing a game. Okay, suddenly we now all have a framework to interact. You know, I have a, a built-in way of socializing with the other people at the party where we can concentrate on having fun uh, and the socialization just sort of happens as a byproduct. So I think that's, that's reason number one, is the way games give our social interactions shape. The other thing that I think games do is they um, create these, these powerful opportunities for us to see other people differently from the way we normally see them. Um, so I have a boss whose name is Patrick. Um, Patrick and I have a very specific sort of boss-employee relationship. That's how we're used to interacting with one another. But if Patrick and I are playing a game where uh, I'm his team captain, then suddenly that interaction is turned on its head. Um, or if we're playing a game where we're opponents, then suddenly we're forced to relate to one another very differently from the way we relate to one another normally. Now there's a word for this uh, in anthropological and uh, performance theory um, called uh, called uh, called uh, communitas, um, and basically communitas is the state that happens when the normal ways of interacting with people in a culture are sort of thrown aside and replaced with an alternate framework for dealing with one another. Uh, it happens, for example, during sporting events. Um, I might be a Wall Street banker and you're a plumber, but for the duration of this sporting event, we can interact as Steelers fans, right? Because there's this alternate social framework in place, and games do this. And so part of what games do is they open up these alternate ways of seeing one another that can deepen relationships or create relationships where they don't exist. Uh, I was in a guild, an online guild, for several years. Uh, our guild leader was a great guy, um, very, very capable. And it took me about three years before I realized that he was actually a 16-year-old guy. Uh, now, normally, that's somebody that I would never have interacted with. Um, but we were friends um, because we were in, uh, interacting in the framework of this game. So um, games provide us with powerful ways uh, to socialize and, and create relationships with other people. And I think that's one of the other reasons why they're so sticky. Last reason why games are so engaging. Um, they activate and engage our mental capacity. So this is a uh, picture of me uh, playing a game called Rock Band. And if you're not familiar with Rock Band, it's a music game where you have these plastic instruments. And they play sort of like real instruments. And then on the, the television screen um, is projected this sort of no note score. And you have to play your instrument in accordance with this note score. Um, and the better you play, uh, the better reaction you get from the crowd. And the worse you play, uh, you can uh, drop out of the song entirely or have people boo at you. So uh, I had the difficulty during this particular game cranked up as high as I could deal with. Uh, and as you can see from my staring eyes and slack jaw, uh, I was concentrating pretty hard. In fact, I was concentrating so hard that I had no sense of what was going on around me. My entire uh, attention was absorbed in trying to play this game. And I was experiencing something that performance theorists call flow. Um, flow is this sort of euphoria that you experience when your mental faculties are completely engaged by a task at hand, so fully that you're not capable of paying any attention to the outside world. Um, if you ask famous performers uh, about the, the state of euphoria that they experience when they're performing on stage, that is flow. Um, there are not a lot of opportunities for us to experience flow in our everyday lives. There are not a lot of tasks that completely and totally engage our, our attention uh, in the way that games do, especially video games. Um, so, you know, a lot of the reason people play video games is to experience this state of, of flow, of euphoria. 
Um, and Jane McGonigal in her book Reality is Broken says that she thinks that this is why the gamer generation is having such a hard time in school because they know what this state of complete engagement feels like. And so when they get to, into a classroom where they're often not activated and engaged, they get very frustrated because they know what they're missing. So this is, I think, the third reason um, why games are so compelling is because they activate uh, our complete mental faculties. They focus our attention and give us this state of flow. Uh, this is, I thought, just a funny graphic. Um, but also, one of the things McGonagall talks about in her book is the, why it is that people spend so much time playing video games. And she says it's because of this, these opportunities for socialization, this um, positive reinforcement loop where uh, people are rewarded for achievement in ways that they can't get as much or as well in real life. And so this is the reason that why people are spending so much time in games as opposed to reality. Um, and so her solution to this problem, the normal solution to this problem is to say to people, well, you shouldn't play games so much. Um, McGonagall says, well, what if we could make reality more like video games? Uh, and that's a lot of what gamification is about. It's trying to bring that sense of engagement and immediacy out of games and into reality. So, okay, how do we do that? What are the specific techniques that we can use to gamify systems? Um, there are a lot of gaming techniques, and I couldn't possibly talk about all of them. So what I've done is select a grab bag of three or four um, that I'll talk about in, in some depth. And hopefully that'll give you an idea of the range of different gamification techniques that are available. Okay, so gamification technique number one, points and point systems. Almost every game that we play has some sort of, sort of point scoring system. Uh, and it can be a very complex system, or it can be a very simple system. It can be a very obvious system, or it can be a very inobvious in system. Um, for example, Pac-Man has a scoring system. And it's really simple. You know, the longer you stay alive, the more uh, bullets you eat, the more ghosts you chow down on, the higher your score gets. Uh, and the score at the top of the screen just keeps ratcheting upward and upward and upward until you die. It's very simple. Bridge has a very complicated scoring scheme, one that I don't even pretend to understand. Poker has a scoring scheme. There is a metric in poker that we use to determine your level of success, and it is money. Um, so that's not necessarily obvious, but it's definitely there. Um, so anything that you can count can become the basis of a scoring system. And the purpose of a scoring system is to quantify achievement. Once you have a scoring system, you can put a sort of uh, concrete value on uh, players' effort, and that is the value in scoring systems. Once you have a scoring system, you can create a leaderboard. A leaderboard does two really important things. The first thing it does is it establishes a hierarchy um, within which you can see uh, how well you are doing compared to how well someone else is doing. How many points do I have versus how many points does someone else have? And this activates your killers and your achievers in the group because the killers will look at that board and say, well, I only have to have 50 more points um, to uh, move up to the next position on the leaderboard. And the achievers will say, look how much I've achieved and look how everybody else can see it, which is the second thing that leaderboards do. To be effective, they have to be public. They have to be viewable. People have to be able to see them. So they make your achievement explicit to other people. Um, as an example here, I've pulled the, uh, the leaderboard from Angry Birds. And I want to call your attention to some of the things this leaderboard is doing in terms of the different ways you can slice leaderboard data. So you can see how well you're doing against all uh, players of Angry Birds at all times, or you can slice it by only this week or only today. But the other interesting thing that it's doing is it's slicing the, the sort of overall leaderboard, all the players of Angry Birds, um, against you and your friends. So you can see how well you're doing against everyone or how well you're doing only against your friends. Um, and that's really important because you probably care more about how you're doing against the people in your peer group than how you're doing against random strangers. So um, the different ways that you can slice a leaderboard can be very motivational. Okay, uh, points are something you're going to award to people uh, for actions you want them to repeat over and over and over again. But there are other ways of rewarding achievements, and one of them is badging. Okay, badging, as opposed to points, commemorates very specific achievements um, or commemorates a, a specific milestone. So, for example, you might tie badges to a leveling system, um, or you might tie badges to a very specific achievement that a player can only get once. 
Um, something else that people do with badges is they often use them to activate the explorers in their group by not telling players what sort of badges they can earn. So the only way you can figure out what achievements are possible is by playing the game. Um, so it can add a sense of mystery and surprise. Now, a badge doesn't always have to be a literal badge. Um, for example, uh, American Express has a badging system. They have a gold card, they have a platinum card, they have a black card, they have a green card. And each one of those cards is tied to an implicit leveling and point system, which is based on money. So a badge doesn't have to be a badge. It can be a color, it can be a, a shirt, it can be anything that's a sort of visual marker. Um, and because they're visual, they can carry a surprisingly complex set of meanings. So for example, I've pulled uh, this badge from Foursquare. If you're not com uh, familiar with Foursquare, Foursquare is a social networking game where you check into locations using the GPS on your phone and you score points for the number of different locations you check into in a given period of time. And you can unlock badges and achievements by checking into specific combinations of venues. And this badge is the douchebag badge. To get the douchebag badge, you actually have to check into a uh, specific number of locations that other users of Foursquare have voted to be douchebag locations. And so this is a very ambiguous sort of, of badge where it's sort of reward, but it's sort of not a reward. Um, it's certainly one of Foursquare's most uh, controversial badges. And it sort of illustrates the different levels of meaning that can be attached to a visual icon. Okay, gaming technique number four, levels. Levels are a progress marker. They show you where you are in the game, how much content you have experienced, and how much content you have left to experience. They're also one of the game mechanics that uh, quantifies, experience, quantifies experience, quantifies achievement. Um, so, for example, when you're in World of Warcraft, one of the first thing that you can learn about somebody else's uh, avatar by clicking on it is what level they are. And so immediately you have a sort of measurement as to how advanced they are in the game compared to how advanced you are in the game, which again activates your killers and achievers. Now, normally the way level progression is designed is the first levels are very easy to acquire. And uh, successive levels are very difficult to acquire. And what this does is it draws players into the game by making early achievement very easy and gradually increasing the amount of engagement uh, and effort it takes uh, to reach the highest levels. So for example, in World of Warcraft, to get from level one to level two is about 400 experience points. And you can probably do it in about 10 minutes. To get to level 85, from 84, which is the highest level in the game, takes about 4 million experience points and took me about a week and a half. So what I have here is just an example of some levels from Angry Birds. Um, and in Angry Birds, the, the difficulty curve doesn't really start rising until you hit stage three. There's a particular level in stage three where there's only one sequence of actions that will get you through the board. Um, and so when you hit that level, you really know that you, you've started to hit that increasing achievement curve. Some general principles of gamification. You can gamify anything. And I mean anything. There have been successful games designed around hairdressing, waiting tables, air traffic control. Um, and you can gamify on a large or a small scale. It doesn't have to be... I've noticed that in education, we often get hung up on what we can't do when we talk about gamification. And, you know, we say things like, well, we can't possibly build a massively multiplayer online environment the size of World of Warcraft. Well, why would you want to? We wouldn't know what to do with 10 million subscribers if we had them. You know, set more realistic goals. If we could just get 50% more users to engage with us five more hours a week, we would have more engagement than we knew what to do with. So we don't necessarily need to build a huge, massively multiplayer online environment. Um, and that brings me to my next point, which is that more complex games are not necessarily better. Okay, World of Warcraft, very complicated and very successful. Tetris, also very successful and very simple. So the fun has to come first. Um, you know, the problem with a lot of educational gaming, according to the people that I've been reading, is that the educational goal comes first, and then uh, people try to make it fun. But that can't work. The game has to be fun. It's an opt-in activity, and that means that people have to choose to play it. And in order to choose to play it, it has to be fun. So if you're going to design games, then suddenly what is fun becomes very important to you. You have to set clear goals as to what you want to accomplish. 
Um, gamification can help you generate engagement in all sorts of different ways. You have to be very clear about where you want to create engagement and what that increased engagement is going to look like. The mechanics of your game have to support your goals. Um, once you've set goals for the game, you have to look at behaviors that you want to reward and come up with metrics and point scoring systems that actually support those goals. And of course, you have to offer people something they actually want. Uh, if your gamification technique is wrapped around something people are not interested in, then your game will fail. Now, theoretically, in libraries, we have something that people want, right? We have all of this information that could help make their, their papers and their schoolwork and their life better. So we just need to figure out how to make that more enticing so that people will buy into it and use it. Uh, I also wanted to point out that games have the uncanny ability to make work fun. Um, people will put in an enormous amount of effort in a game to achieve something. When I'm in World of Warcraft, there is literally not a moment, not a second that I spend that I am not trying to accomplish something. Um, and often those goals are extremely difficult and time consuming. So games can make work fun. But in order to do that, the game has to be elective. You can't force people to play. If you do, it's not fun. Games are, by their definition, elective uh, activities. Uh, you have to offer people immediate feedback so that you can set up that positive feedback loop where they're giving uh, effort and they're constantly getting rewarded for it. Um, you have to look at how to engage people's entire capability. Game designers look for what they call the flow zone. If you make your game too hard, then people get frustrated and they drop out. If you make your game too easy, people get bored and they drop out. So you have to match the challenge very closely to the capability of the player. Um, Another way that games can make work fun is by fitting that work into a larger context where the player feels like the effort that they're putting in is part of an effort that is larger than themselves. A really good example in World of Warcraft is end game raiding. Okay, end game raiding is uh, a process where players have to raid these extremely difficult dungeons and they take very large groups of people to conquer, 10 to 25. Uh, and the process of preparing for that is extremely time consuming. Um, it can take weeks for a group to coordinate and learn and accumulate all the resources that they need to raid. And the reason people love to do it is because they feel like they're part of this much larger effort. So trying to fit in the work that you're doing to some sort of uh, framework within, that gives it a larger meaning uh, can be extremely motivational. The other thing that games do is they make the consequences for failure very low. Gamers often cultivate a very optimistic uh, mindset because in a game when you fail the worst that happens is you lose a life or you have to start over uh, and so there's tremendous incentive to try again uh, because gamers know if they just try harder if they just get a little bit better they will be able to beat the current challenge and once again like I said before everything has the potential to be fun including library research uh, I thought this was just a, a funny illustration of the last point uh, and here endeth the talk.